Hey everyone, it's Nick. I wanted to go over a concept in implant prosthetics called platform switching. We were planning on doing a treatment planning session tonight, but unfortunately uh, several of you couldn't show up. Uh, so I thought it might be better that we table this important discussion, but I at least wanted to keep the momentum going and have a discussion about platform switching, micro gap, and platform design. Uh, about 10 minutes long. So let's start with what platform switching is. The first generation of implants had prosthetics, in this case the abutment, uh, that had an outer diameter that was the same diameter as the implant at its uh, most coronal portion. Um, when they're at the same level, that's called a um, platform matching implant. Platform switching is when the abutment connection where it meets the implant is at a point more towards the center of the implant. So in essence, this outer diameter of the abutment where it meets the implant is at a distance farther away from the outer diameter of the implant at that same level. In this case here, there's an oblique um, obliqueness to uh, the top of the implant. But the point is that the micro gap, which is the space that exists between the prosthetic component and the implant exists at a point somewhere away from the outer diameter of the implant. That's platform switching. Why did we, why did the dental industry come up with platform switching? Well, it came out of the science that <clears throat> um, was trying to make sense of why there was crestal bone loss around implants. And before we uh, before we talk about it, let's take a look at the external hex implant. So this is the first generation of platforms that existed on implants really from, you know, all the way back in the late 60s when Brandenmark came out with dental implants, really right up until uh, the internal hex was invented in the early 2000s. Um, <clears throat> essentially, the external hex does not have a whole lot of... Um, biomechanical uh, value. What do we mean by that? Well, when you put a screw through here to hold the prosthetics together, the only amount of space that's holding the two components together is essentially this right here, which we can think of as a ferrule uh, on a crown. Uh, because of that, there was a lot of percolation that existed around the implant. Uh, to talk about percolation, let's go back to this image here. Percolation is essentially the fluid movement, and with there, where there's fluid, there's bacteria. There's no blood supply inside the implant, so we know there's bacteria there. Where there's movement, there's, where there's fluid and movement, we know bacteria will be moving around in this area. Well, the body knows that, and what it does, it moves the biologic width away or the crustal bone establishing a biologic width away from the space where the bacteria are. You can think of that as the CEJ or a crown margin. Uh, the body knows that because there's bacteria there. You know, we, I, I don't know, at least in my training, it was ever articulated that that's actually what's going on. But the biologic width is essentially an inflammatory response to the presence of bacteria until there's a certain distance established between the bone and that um, nidus of bacteria, okay? So they found during the 2000s that the external hex implant had the most amount of bone loss, so then they came up with the internal hex, which is a separate conversation. The point here is that when they created the internal hex, which is this guy here, you can see the hexagon is on the inside of the implant, not on the outside. Uh, there's also a conical taper to this implant itself. Uh, but what that does, it decreases the amount of percolation because there's more engagement between the abutment and the implant. In addition, because the platform is switched, meaning it's not matched, the prosthetic component does not match to the implant diameter, Instead, it's inset, or in this case, platform switched. The bone actually does a lot better. And that's why platform switching has become the 
primary mode of um, connections, prosthetic connections in implant dentistry today. Uh, every, uh, as far as I know, every major implant company has a platform switch option. As a matter of fact, more and more implant companies are actually phasing out their external hex, these implants here, because of the fact that there's just so much micro movement going on. So if we take a step back and look at an electron micrograph of the space that actually lives between the prosthetics and the implant, we can actually see that there's quite a bit of space there. Even with properly fitting components, this little space to bacteria is quite a large uh, volume of space for them to live very happily. Then along comes the force, mastication, and the, although we think implants are solid, um, they do have micro movement, creating percolation of the micro gap, and that percolation is what um, es causes establishment of the biologic width from a, you know, a distance away from that. The farther in we can go, in theory, the better the bone is going to be around the implant. Now there is a law of diminishing return at which if you go too far, then you compromise the structural integrity of the prosthetic components. Uh, with that said, this is a much better scenario than this. So we have a couple concepts here, platform switching, micro gap, external and internal hex. The internal hex allowed platform switching to happen. That's the only reason I brought this up here. You cannot platform, well, could you platform switch an external hex? You, you could. I don't think they ever did that. But the external, or sorry, the internal hex allowed for this to happen very predictably. And the other part of this, the conical shape. So there's a conical connection is a very important part of implant prosthetics. And we're gonna go over that next week. Uh, just know when you hear the word conical, they're not talking about the, um, the hexagon. They're talking about the component that goes from the hexagon to the platform head. Uh, there were implant systems that didn't have any hex hexes. It was purely a conical connection. Uh, but most implant companies have found that when they have some sort of registrating um, internal connection, in this case a hexagon, um, combined with a conical uh, component, uh, they have much better results. Nobel had a, um, had a patent on the conical connection for many years, and I believe that patent ran up recently, and most implant companies now have, quote unquote, the conical connection. Uh, we'll go over that in more detail, but I just wanted to end with the implant system that we use, BioHorizons. Uh, th this is their implant line, uh, five different implants. This is a platform switch, and this is a platform switched implant, the yellow ones. As you can see, the outer diameter of the implant is a very different diameter than the platform where the prosthetics go. That inset difference allows for the bone to exist higher up on the implant and not cause dieback or vertical, you know, vertical bone defect or anything like that. Well, they also have older implants that weren't platform switch, this implant here and this implant here. As you can see, the platform exists at a diameter that matches the outer diameter of the implant. And then lastly, there's their tissue level implant, which looks very similar to most tissue level implants. Strawman being the, you know, the, the, the pioneer with the soft tissue implant, at least uh, they were the ones that really had a hold on the market during the 2000s. And um, a soft tissue level implant doesn't have a micro gap that relates to the crest of bone because the micro gap is all the way up here where your crest of bone is all the way down here. The purpose of the soft tissue level implant was to remove the micro gap away from the bone. The problem with a soft tissue level implant is you're, you're limiting your ability to create an emergence profile because the implant is predefined. Therefore, it, it uh, negates the ability to actually create good contours and close papilla spaces and what have you. Uh, so it's still a popular implant. It's just not one that um, most clinicians use these days. A lot of surgeons still place them because they don't have to restore crowns. 
general dentists that have to restore implants uh, typically don't use soft tissue level implants because of that reason, because they understand the challenges that ensue after the fact. Therefore, this implant right here by BioHorizons is the workhorse. Most implant companies out there have something just like this, conical connection, internal hex, platform switched, tapered with aggressive thread. Um, that is the uh, most studied implant on the market today, hands down. Uh, BioHorizons also has laser lock technology at the crest of the implant, but that's a topic for another day. So that's about it. I just wanted to share those concepts, platform switching, micro gap, internal and ex external hex. If you don't understand those, please send me an email. I will uh, plan on talking more about this next week. As a restorative dentist, this is critical. You can have the best surgeon in the world with the best placed implant. If the restorative dentist doesn't know what they're choosing, it might match, it might fit. But if the decision-making process doesn't lead to good clinical outcomes, um, the patient's not getting ultimately what they paid for. At the end of the day, implants are tricky. If you do them well, they can be great. But if you don't do them well, they can be a disaster. Please understand these concepts as a restorable, <laughs> restorable, as a restorative dentist, and I promise you, your clinical outcomes for your patients will be much greater. All right. Hope all is well, and we will see you all next week.